a Jai Shah. Whoop the Irish. Okay, what's going on, guys? And welcome to a brand new episode of Energize. Russ, introduce the guests, man. We've got the OGs of the Irish media MMA game in with us today. We have Andrew McGatton <laughs> and PT Carroll. Lads, I wore the red check shirt to remind oh. myself of Andrew McGatton. What do you think, Andrew? It's beautiful. Uh, where is it from? I think this is a River Island, lad. Of course, from, it's Gaff, no? from River Island. Yeah, it has to oh. be done, has to be done. Peasy, does this give you fond memories of the red check shirt? I mean, <laughs> to be fair, I think I've seen it in about four different continents at this stage, Andy, right? Like, I mean, it went everywhere and it was it was a real thing. Like, I mean, I can remember Andrew walking through the MGM um, even before the first Poirier fight and people were mobbing him. Like, everywhere he went, he was so recognizable. The, the main guy interviewing uh, the Irish fighters before they took off the international stages. And he had a huge following, man. Like, I mean, Andrew, Andrew's the only one out of the whole crew that didn't drink, but he was probably out later than all of us taking pictures with people throughout the nights. Like, I mean, what are you talking about? Th- those nights, those nights in, in uh, Vegas um, were crazy back then. And like everyone, everyone that was in my year in school were at those fights. Like, do you remember how, how many people we knew going to the fights back then, Andrew? Like, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. That's why I always compare it to, you know, McGregor's initial ascent there in the UFC, Poirier, Mendez, Aldo, Diaz, and um, then Alvarez in New York. It really was like our generation's Italian 90. Like we had no other sporting element that seemed to conduct so many people to them and then have such success as well. Like, I mean, I don't think it's ever going to happen again with, with uh, a fighter being as successful as McGregor in the UFC. So it really are proud to have been a part of it and proud to have been there for all of it. But um, I was certainly a backseater compared to that man over there with the famous no shirt. Way. You see, I didn't, I didn't develop my signature. Look, why didn't you ever help me, Andrew? Why didn't you ever develop, help me develop you, my signature? I, look? You see that, I think that we were all, uh, I think we were not even pigeonholed, but like you were too busy actually doing a load of work every time in Vegas. You couldn't go anywhere. You were literally running from somewhere to say like, I need, I need to go and write. Like, PC used to lock himself in his hotel room for hours and hours after everything because he would be writing articles for, like, five different publications and doing r- media, doing radio, doing everything. And then he'd surface out at night for food, for chicken wings and hooters. And then he'd go back. <laughs> like, it was literally... I, I don't know. I think it was also... Uh, one of my favorite things that we did was the Mendez fight when we did, like... We just were like, oh, we should do videos like where we would talk about after the wins and before the wins. And Gareth A. Davies kept interrupting us. <laughs> and he was just like, we were just standing on camera back and forth talking about things. It was like what, what he's saying about people being there and like all of his year there. I remember there was one time where we did a video for balls.ie and like 75% of the people that were in the video were just people that I knew from Ireland who were at the fights. <laughs> and I was like, here. <laughs> You come in here and talk to me about this. You come in here and talk to me about this and pass it off as fan reaction videos. Yeah. So it was like, I don't know. There was, there was something really special about it. And it's like, it's, I like, I couldn't be happier that like, that we got to do it. Like looking mm. like maybe we took it for granted at the time. Like that's the one thing that I would say, like we were in Vegas, maybe every three to six months for like two year period straight. Whereas like in the last two years, people haven't been able to travel and do stuff like that. So yeah, I just thought it was, like it is something that I'll never forget. Like, and it, I wasn't old enough for Italian ninety. I wasn't even born. But like, there's definitely we will never have anything like that again. No fighter from this island will ever captivate people to the sport as much as as he did. Yeah. We don't think we'll have a, a sports person in general doing any sport that will captivate people the way Conor McGregor captivated it. Like the whole of Dublin was going around wearing dicky bows, you know, saying his one liners. You know what I mean? Walking you you couldn't walk into a nightclub without seeing some fucking Egypt, myself included, probably wearing a dicky bow at some stage. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like we, we were we were all obsessed with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's what's interesting to me. Like, I mean, Connor's um Connor's more famous internationally than he has ever been, right? Like, I mean, he's more well known, he's a bigger icon than he's ever been. But I, I still don't think I had the cultural cultural significance to Irish people as it did on that initial run. Of course, he still has a huge fan base, of course. Irish people are going to be tuning into the, the fight this Saturday. But that moment, us all stuck in a recession, people who were the same age as Connor were just getting out of college with no jobs to go to. And here's a guy setting off and following his dreams in a sport that most people had never heard of. 
like at that at that particular time, I think it meant more to Irish people to see him doing that and and really putting Ireland on the map. You know what I mean? Like it, it went from you'd be on holidays in Santa Ponza when you're eight or whatever, and people would say, "Oh, you're from Ireland, Guinness." And then it was, <laughs> "Oh, you're from Ireland, Conor McGregor." You know that that's the way it is and the way it has been since then. And um, yeah, so I I just think that initial run, 2014, 2016. It was uh, it was hugely significant for Irish people what he was doing then. Yeah. And then Andrew, Andrew, you went on work for the McLeod for a while, didn't you? Yeah, two thousand and sixteen. What was that, what was that uh, like? It was great, to be honest. I I was only talking about it with someone the other day. I ended up uh, getting to go to a good run of US events. It was kind of like for me, I can remember it being really upset. Like I can remember getting really upset leaving the Severe MMA podcast and stuff, just because I think. I'd speak for everyone who was involved in it from and the early run up is that we felt a real sense strength towards the name of it and stuff like that and what it had kind of done and the reputation that it had built. And uh, so I remember it, actually going up to you uh, at UFC Dublin. You probably don't remember this, but I went, Andrew McGatton, severe MMA. And then yeah, <laughs> and you broke your shite, you broke your shite laughing at it. And then I, I was like, I was like, I was like, th- like that was the start of every interview. And you just knew like that was you, man. It was part of your, your identity in the game. Yeah, and like that's not not to be bad or good or bad about it. Like that's a only now, only in the last twelve months have I been able to really shake that. Despite having stopped doing it nearly nearly three years ago this October, <laughs> like that's when you grow up on the internet, when you grow up on social media, when you mature from eighteen. Like I was going to them events from before I was eighteen. When I went to Boston for the first time, Graham, who owns Severe MMA, had to check me into my hotel because I was under 20, 21. <laughs> like, Graham had to come in and check me in for it. So there's like, that was definitely a hard thing to detach myself from because it, it was my identity. It was something that I cared cared about so much. But the opportunity with the Mac life with Connor, like, to be honest, to be able to go, like, to Toronto and to be able to go to Boston and stuff like that, to the different numbered pay-per-view cards, the ones in Europe and stuff, and to have... Like I used to get terrible travel anxiety because how are we going to afford going to a McGregor fight? So to be told, like, you don't have to worry about working in a nightclub to be able to go to Vegas. We'll send you to Vegas and you get paid for your work. Like that was just like a complete 180 from what had previously been happening. It was like a dream come true. So that's that's part of the thing. Like despite maybe not or falling out of love with it a wee bit towards the end, I was just like, this is like, I'd, ne- I'd never take that for granted like being able to like having your breakfast in america is delicious you know? <laughs> <laughs> especially so, when yeah. you send the receipt to someone else <laughs> yeah, keeping the receipt. but yeah no it was it was really good and the one thing i would say just about them and like there's a guy there was a guy there who wasn't necessarily an mma fan but he's incredibly forward thinking his name's carl carl o'brien and he uh the mac life got routinely praised by a lot of people who for their social stuff, for their graphics. They were one of the first people in the MMA sphere to start using Instagram as like an image and text collaborative in terms of like taking a quote from an interview, putting it together. And it's since become like an industry standard to the point that I was getting DMs from people who are high up in other outlets now who are saying like, who does your graphics? Because that's a really good idea. So now it's, you don't, you don't go past an interview that isn't transcribed into a text-based form. So it's like the, de- the like, the fact that they've grown the platform to as big as it is, whether it's millions of followers and stuff like that on Instagram and thing, it's like they didn't ever need me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was just content on it. Do you know what I mean? It was a vehicle in itself. So it's done well. well like, I wouldn't, you I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't you necessarily say that. say that. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Go on, Basel. Do I? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think I think a lot of things our shows do really well. It's people see themselves in the interviewer or even the athlete, maybe, and that's what continuously gets them to follow them. And then, like, once you build up a bit of rapport and you know the people know what they're talking about, that's why we're, 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 I think we're doing very well because we're us. And it's not really me. I think we're more the fan here. But I think it's people saw you knew exactly you were getting on. Connor trusted you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then people invest into yourself as well. I'm not, but I'm not very, I'm not too sure about used to boys. Uh, but like Ross, this is very nostalgic vibes. You know I mean, like we love this sport so much you've seen so many interviews you've both done and then to have you both on i think it was like almost like the perfect idea ahead of this weekend's uc 264 breakdown which is exactly the show um i also want to mention as well like it was just you you lads are like get me going there and i wasn't going to mention but obviously conor mcgregor gave us a shout out live on instagram there the other day 
And then like the day, like the day before we found out we weren't being put on the UC 264 countdown video. I mean, Ross, cool. Ross we got, cool. we didn't, yeah, we didn't make the cut and we were very disappointed. And the next day that happens is just this, this world is just absolutely crazy. But we do want to thank you very much lads for coming on the show. And if you are new to the show, make sure to like and subscribe. But I think we probably should get into the show now, you know, whoa, 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 Bosmo, before, before you go any further, PT Carroll's got some big news as well. Uh, oh yeah, for ahead, PT. Yeah, you, ahead. you, you, you've, uh, you recently signed a new deal there. Uh, what someone? Do you want to just tell tell the listeners what what you're up to? Yeah, um, we signed a deal last week uh, for the Ringer, who um, who are owned by Spotify. So I'm going to be doing um, pre fight, post fight stuff with uh, our, me and Andrew's good friend Ariel Hawani. So that's starting very soon. I don't think I'm allowed to announce when it starts yet. I'm very afraid of putting my foot in it in some way or another. But I'm sure you'll hear very soon. Ariel has. A significantly bigger following than me, so I'm sure you will hear about it when it's about to start. But it's very exciting. Um, I've, I've worked with Ariel a lot over the years. I worked with him for some MMA fighting, um, and yeah, we've been very good friends for the last decade or so. So yeah, I'm looking forward to being um a regular host with him on this show. So yeah, you should be hearing about it very very soon. I'm afraid to say anything. That's all right. Yeah, no, you don't have very to say anything. Just uh, PT PT Carroll and Ariel Hawani. PT is going to be the A side in this one. <laughs> yeah, we love I'm, it. Uh, I hope he gets a few followers out of my great spotlight. I'm going to put on him. That's exactly. all I can ask. You know. Exactly. Exactly. I'll make sure to give him a follow tomorrow. You know, because I never heard the fella. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Basmo, uh, you might want to get a time stamp now for when we actually get into UFC 264, right? Yeah, uh, I'll let you uh take it away, right? You can go back in the driving seat there, okay? Here we go, lads. Right, this weekend, Conor McGregor for Centauri, Dustin Poirier for the third time. Obviously, Conor won the first time, obviously, Dustin won the second time. Now, there's a trilogy, PT. We're gonna start with yourself, bud. What you, what you make of the build up with this and the way Conor has gone silent in the build up? Um. You see, I think I drew a lot of parallels between the quick turnaround on this one from the, like, as in from the second Poirier fight to this third fight. Um, I drew a lot of parallels with that and the immediate rematch with Nate Diaz. So Connor essentially trying to right the wrongs and um, basically get the win back on, on, a, on a rival. But the one thing that was different about this is when, when Connor was rematching Diaz, we heard all about these structural changes. We saw a completely new camp really brought in with the McGregor fast program and stuff like that. And I think one of the big um, criticisms, I guess, from the media, from fans, from coaches and fighters was about the, the second Poirier fight was, you know, a lot of it was geared towards boxing. He had some brilliant training partners from the boxing world come in. You guys interviewed a fair few of them as well. Dylan Moore and the likes of them. Brilliant fighters, but not essentially MMA fighters. Um, this, look, he could have made these changes, but I guess the fact that we haven't heard them hasn't um, hasn't filled people with confidence just yet. Dustin Poirier is the favorite going into this fight, something he wasn't the second time around. So, uh, yeah, that's the biggest difference for me. I think it's very similar that Connor's trying to show us that he has the drive, he has the determination to get this win back. He wanted immediately. He didn't want any other fight. But i just love to see some more some more kind of testament to that inside his camp. And maybe it is there. It's just, we haven't seen it. We haven't heard about it. Like we did. Um, he doesn't do as much media now. And he probably, that's probably because of the Mac life, right? Like he, he has that media yeah. source there. He doesn't exactly need to do too much media because he's such a superstar. But uh, yeah, that's how I feel about it. I, I, I think like, I mean, I, I don't see it like as Poirier is going to go in there and walk the guy. I think McGregor looked really good in the first round of that fight again. I think he's very capable, but it really is about his relevancy this time. If you think about the first fight with Poirier was the thing that proved to us that McGregor was a top five fighter. And now he's fighting him at this stage, seven years later, to, to kind of do the same thing. Like, can he still be a, an elite fighter at lightweight? That, that's the question that everyone's asking ahead of this one. And we're only going to find out on Saturday night. Andrew, obviously Connor is a father now, and we've seen that, that he said before when he was before he fought Aldo. Aldo can concentrate is concentrating his kids and his family and stuff. Where he's hundred percent dedicated to this. Obviously, as time's gone on, he's fought. He's made the hundreds of millions. He sold his uh, proper twelve share. Like this chap, like he's number one. In, what is it? Uh, the was Forbes. it Forbes? Forbes, yeah, number one in Forbes athlete in the world. Um, like what 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 can really drive someone who's at the top of this game, Andrew? Um. I think the same thing that drove him there at the start, like it's 
his head's gone his head's been gone since before he got big you know like if you want to become the best in the world at anything like you do have to break yourself mate like you have to be you have to like sacrifice everything and think that nothing else cares and i would say that a lot of the stuff that has catapulted him in recent years money wise was a manifestation on his own like from when he had first mentioned Floyd Mayweather to when it had actually happened, there was a good period of time there and pe- people just tr- took it as an off the hand cuff from when he initially mentioned Floyd Mayweather. And then it went from like, this would never ever possibly happen to like, this is now happening in <laughs> seven weeks time. The proper 12 stuff was probably like really intelligently crafted in terms of the lead up to the K- Khabib fight. And then, in an ideal world had have beaten Khabib been able to promote it like mad. Now he still did promote it like mad afterwards. He went on a big tour, uh, whether it was like the world cup or, uh, the NFL pictures and stuff like that of him at Cowboy stadium. But I, I would say that even though he's not talking, I do think that he puts out enough hints. I think if you like Instagram or, or Twitter and stuff like that, I know that gives the person the opportunity to choose what they're putting out and not be put under a direct line of questioning from someone to ask specific questions but the biggest take from me is that he didn't come home he didn't see, he wasn't at home in ireland for very long between the fight and going straight back out to out to dubai he basically put himself into like some sort of like he put up a specific post in before my ufc debut or before the first party of fight i trained twice a day seven days a week skills-based training and that's what i'm going back to and the like the workouts that he was doing in the UFC gym in Dubai, seemingly from what he was posting of those workouts, like something on a core machine, like and this was like well over twelve weeks ago. Do you know? Like it's like he did a camp before he actually got training partners out to do a camp. Yeah. And that was like it's come out in the last week through a lawsuit that Paradigm are filing against Manny Pacquiao that Connor was meant to fight Manny Pacquiao on the fifteenth of May this year. So they were completely looking past Paria the last time. Like and maybe that happens sometimes when you start to focus on money or other people start to focus on money that you could make and thus you get a percent of. They'd say like, well, this is what's going to be next. This is what's going to be next. Whereas the reality is one person has to get in and do that job. And it's the person who's who needs to do all the work. <laughs> and it's everybody else that gets the benefit from that one person's work or that one person's spotlight. So I think he's taken this like the best of course, I'm going to say something like this, but I do think he's taken this like ridiculously more seriously than the last fight, just based off the work alone that he has put in before he even had training partners out there. You know, like he does seem to be in very, very good shape, just even from what we're seeing. Like, yeah. so I don't know. I, I, I'd say the motivation is there. I don't think you ever lose it. I think it can dip, but I think your want for being the best in the world will never go especially when you know that your body has physically been capable of doing that at one point in time. It's why maybe we talk so much about the like a BJ Penn or Chuck Liddell or people fighting a little bit later than they should have because they know what their body at one point was capable of. It's their hands, it's their feet, it's their head. You know, they know what they were able to do to other human beings at one time. So I think once you get a, once that's in your life, like you're never going to try, you're never going to think that you're not able to do that again. Ross, obviously, uh, Connor overlooked Nate Diaz, came back after everyone said Connor was basically finished, came back and won. Obviously, now with Dustin Poirier, it looks like people are saying, oh, he's done, he has all the money, he's not, he doesn't even care anymore. Uh, like, I don't, uh, Connor doesn't tend to really like when people are saying he's basically finished, Ross. No, and like, well, put it this way, I don't think anyone likes the, someone to say that they're finished in any aspect of their career. Um, look, he, I think he needs the doubters. I think that's what he thrived on his way up. You know, I think PT touched on it earlier. You know, they said he couldn't be the top five guy. He'd be Dustin Poirier. They said, you know, he couldn't be the wrestler. He'd be Chad Mendes. And now people are saying he can't beat this version of Dustin Poirier. And I think that's probably the motivation he needs. I do think it's going to be a bit more of a tactical battle this time out. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what McGregor does with the calf kick. Would he stand in the boxing stance? Would he go back to sort of his more karate style stance? What way is that going to go? Um, Because a calf kick is such a unique technique as well. It's not something that was really around when McGregor was on the rise. People weren't utilizing as much. And on top of that also, it's not something you can overly practice in training as well. You know what I mean? You're wearing your sort of leg protective gear as you're doing your sparring. And if you're not, you're probably not kicking each other full force in the calf. So it's a very unique thing within the game that's stopped some very good fighters. So it will be very intriguing, Basmo. 
Yeah, PT. Obviously, since the Connor lost to the Poirier, there was all that that st- stuff going on about the money that didn't go to the charity. Yada yada yada. But what do you expect now with Dustin Poirier going in here now? Obviously, you got a touch of the McGregor, the red panty night, as one would call it. Like, what 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 Dustin Poirier are you looking? Are you expecting to see in the octagon this Saturday? I think it's going to be very similar to what we saw the last time out. Um, I think. You know, he, he's going to be used. Like, I expect Conor to be very different, to be honest. The, even the way he was, his stance in the last fight was a bit strange. It was a pure kind of a, a boxing stance. So I, I, I doubt we're going to see that. But if he's back in that karate stance, he's obviously going to be leaving the leg out there again. I think he'd be far better prepared for that. But, you know, calf kicks or no calf kicks, that fight wasn't finished because of calf kicks. You know, he, he ate a load of punches up against the fence, which we've never really seen Conor doing before. Um, I think it's, I think it's a lot more than calf kicks. And I, I think it was actually very clever of the likes of John Kavanaugh and stuff to talk more about the calf kicks. So it distracted people from the fact that he got TKO'd. Um, you know, Connor didn't stop holding his leg and go down to the ground and tap out. Like, I mean, he, he got punched out there. And that's, that's a worrying sign for McGregor fans. But as I said, in the first round, even though he was in a strange stance, like, think about what Poirier did to Holloway when they fought. He put on a clinic. He... Yeah. he he beat him from pillar to post for five rounds, and he looked so elite, such an elite striker. Connor looked like a brilliant striker in the first round of that fight. So he just needs to be able to elongate, elongate that, stay out of the pocket, because I, I think Poirier can hit very, very hard when someone's coming at him like, like Connor does. And Connor takes chances because he believes in his power. Like, I mean, some of the stuff he was doing in the first round of that fight was beautiful. The yeah. jab, the left hand, how, he, how he's moving his feet to land the left hand. He's sending Poirier flying against the fence, but it was just, I, I think he probably took a bit too many risks with Poirier in the exchanges. So I agree with Russ to a certain extent that he's just going to have to be a bit more clever about this, play it a bit more safe and maybe respect the power of Poirier a bit more. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's one thing that not a lot of people are talking about. Like Connor got TKO'd when they fought in January. And it's you know, not break, that long It breaks the Irish people's hearts saying that, you know what I mean? Like we all, like, I, I know, but it's reality. <laughs> like it's reality. And, and January wasn't that far away, you know, realistic. <laughs> yeah. And it never really happened to Connor before and, until he fought Mayweather. And but he wasn't even out against Mayweather, PD. He was like out, out against Poirier. On yeah, yeah, 100%. And, and it's just like, you know, this guy hasn't won at lightweight since 2016. I think people who have questions about his relevancy in the division right now are, are right to have them. But as you said, the guy that we all fell in love with in that initial run, he loved that. He loved people thinking this guy might not be able to do it. And I think the questions about, oh, is it this Connor? Is it that Connor? Like, this is a very, very good test to find out where he's at. And, you know, in, in terms of all the businesses, things like that, he's a, he's an, a huge success. Like, I, I don't think you'd change that part of Connor's story if, if you are anyone, really, because it's, made, it's put him into a new stratosphere of earning. We know UFC fighters don't get paid enough, and he is earning so much money from all these different enterprises. But for me, there is no doubt that that takes away from you, your, your training, that takes away from your training schedule. You can't be that successful in the business world and not have a takeaway from, you know, your key passion, which is fighting. Like, Andrew, I always go back to that first interview, but the first interview that really struck me from Severe MMA was, was just Connor hitting a heavy bag. Remember that Graham and, and Paddy yeah. went up to record him? And he's just, he has no concept of businesses. He has no concept of that side of the game. He's... He's talking about how he's staying up all night watching gorillas fighting. Like, I mean, if you're selling businesses for hundreds, hundreds of millions, you can't be staying up all night watching gorillas fighting, unfortunately, even though it's a really cool thing to do. You just we can't. The, we need the uh, uh, pot to piss in and the blueberry eating Conor McGregor back. But that, I, I interviewed him for, uh, and I was only looking back on these quotes recently. I interviewed him for Fighters Only, I had the magazine somewhere there, in, in 2013. And I asked him, like, like, uh, you know, oh, I'd say a lot of people are coming at you with endorsements and things like that. And he didn't give it. He didn't care. He was like, I don't want to wear any of these stupid T-shirts. Like, I don't care about any of that stuff. And I was like, well, what are you going to buy with all this money? He's like, I don't care about buying things. I, you know what I mean? I just want a lot of free shit. Like, I don't care. And now it's like how quickly he transformed himself into this tycoon is unbelievable. It's so impressive. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't know if you can still be that guy. You know, that guy that's just that one sole focus. All I want to do is be the best at unarmed combat in the world. I don't know if you can be that guy. 
and be this amazing tycoon that's top of the Forbes list at the same time. I, I think that's a lot to ask of anyone, mm. right? Definitely, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think another thing that people like are completely sleeping on uh, going into fight, and you touched on PD, is Dustin Poirier is Rome. He like he, the last, if you exclude the Khabib fight, the last time he lost was in 2016 to, to Michael Johnson. Like he's beat the who's who, the absolute elite of lightweight and the featherweight champion uh, Max Holloway on that run. And like he's finished a lot of them as well. Like your Eddie Alvarez, your Justin Gaethje, and like he's put these guys away. He is like the elite of the elite. I think people, a lot of people, and sometimes I'm guilty of myself. They look at almost the UFC 178 Dustin Poirier and they think it's going to be, you know, a same guy. He is a totally different animal up at 155. And he's the own crown king of that division, whether people want to say that or not. He is the number one fighter in that division. If you took the belt off Charles Oliveira and they did the rankings, Dustin Poirier would be number one and no one would even question him. And, and he's a nightmare matchup for Charles Oliveira. Like when you look through the, the rankings, including McGregor, include well, probably not Habib, but including everybody else, like if you at the your target, who who is the hardest matchup for Charles Oliveira there? I, I think it'd probably be Poirier. I honestly do. Uh, I, I, I do think all. he's exceptional. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's so he, he's so many dimensions. But when you have a superstar and a, a personality and a guy who's transcended the sport like McGregor. It's it's hard not to be blinded by the lights. Like even being around him uh, over the years, like I mean, he has that kind of aura about him. Like I'd say, it's exceptionally hard to fight that dude. Like if you've been in his presence, you can just feel it off him. Yeah. And I've never really got that off any other fighter. So yeah, I can only imagine what it's like when he's throwing you? digs at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously, obviously, you boys like met him a lot of times. So this story is pretty shit. But like we we were out one night and Connor Ross said Connor was over there. I was like, really? He's like, no. And then I was like, all right. And then he's like, he was. And I went over to Connor. He was almost like he was levitating off the ground. It was <laughs> now I don't know how many drinks I had that stage, but like, <laughs> but I mean, like, yeah, as you said, that put it even bringing up the last time we had um Chris Fields on the show breaking the, the preview, and he just couldn't even fathom Poirier winning. And then the way Poirier was like, like. Um, almost mimicking what McGregor was doing, like the 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 bottle of hot sauce. The they were like almost dancing. It was so weird. It was so weird that I couldn't even. I thought he was so in his head that he was living there rent free, as one would say. But like now, it's it, like Connor says it's going to be like the old Connor. Like like Andrew, like you, you've you've been there. You've been like you've you've seen everything. Like like do you, do you think he has that one more last push in him left? Um. Yeah, but without seeing without seeing from what you've seen maybe before, it's hard to be really certain on that. Like, I definitely think that, like, I understand that a lot of people would consider Khabib to be as dominant as he was, but Dustin Poirier nearly submitted him. Justin Gaethje was about two or three more leg kicks away from actually taking one of his legs out from underneath him. And I do think that it was probably the worst version of Connor that was ever in the UFC that fought Khabib in October 2018. And that's sometimes all you need to happen. Like literally it's such a high stakes, high profile thing that things can go right for you sometimes. And then you have a legacy or things can go wrong for you sometimes. And maybe you ruin your legacy. And that last fight could be the first step in terms of Connor having doing that. Like what, what PC talked about at the start no one can touch and will touch his initial run or the fact that he's been able to make so many millions outside of fighting and become the highest paid athlete. But because it's a game of margins and inches, if you're not a hundred percent focused and switched on to the task at hand, like I nearly got the vibe that the first Paria fight was nearly a sparring match in his eyes that it like, he he Paria said afterwards that he was got well in the first round, that Connor had him hurt in the first round. And Connor didn't seem to maybe pick up on that. This is the guy who you'd never back to win a fight by submission because when he saw somebody was wobbled, he would just turn into a different person and try and cave their skull in. Like literally the, the shots that he threw on Paria from above, like when he dropped Paria in the first fight, that's just a different man than even the one who started the fight. And you'd have to like I do think that that's still in him. But unless you have a level of sharpness and unless you're, you have a level of confidence maybe in what you're about to do, something would tell me that if the stars align correctly, that what he's going for and what he could be capable of just depending on how 170 sits. Pete's going to hate this comment here. But Leon Edwards can beat Usman, but I think Conor McGregor could beat Leon Edwards. And 
you might not be in the realm of unpossibilities to think that before Connor retires, he's actually the only person to hold three titles in three different divisions because now other people have had two-way champ statuses. So the only thing that's going to light a fire under Connor to really make him realize that he could be down in the history books forever is to be the first and only person to hold three titles in three different categories. Now that might just be a step too far, but I don't actually think that it's unfathomable. I really like the size of him at the moment and stuff like that. He's he, I think he could be competitive at 170. But do you think I, on that PT? Because uh, Andrew's calling you out there. <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm only saying that in, in the fact that pt has been the only person this side of the pond and in a major, like, I know it's now become the cool thing to say that, oh, Leon Edwards is overlooked. PT has been championing Leon Edwards for like the last three years solid as being like, this guy is the next fucking, why are we not taking this guy more serious? So like, that's, I, I do like, I do agree with PT in terms of how good he is. I think Usman's on a fantastic level. I think that fight is actually going to be unreal. I think it's disgraceful that Covington is going to be fighting for the title, but I, I just think that it could, it could end up being a McGregor Edwards welterweight title within the next 18 months, 12 to 18 months. And it'd be an easy fight to make because they're both with Paradigm as well. It might make it very, very difficult or very easy one way or the other. It's got to be one of <laughs> no. Um, well, I'm sure, well, I'm sure Leon Edwards has probably been fighting for the last five years for a big payday, and that's what it takes. He probably say no bother. Yeah, 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 but like, I mean, this is the problem, right? McGregor makes us think like that because he does the the he does things that we couldn't actually believe he did. Aldo, you know, Eddie Alvarez, that masterful performance, he makes us believe in things because we we've seen that previous form. But right now, he hasn't won a, a fight at lightweight in how many years? Five, and we're talking about he could be the welterweight champion. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like that, like there, look, he is a guy that can do unbelievable things. There's no doubt about that. But right now the task at hand is very difficult as far as I'm concerned. Like, I mean, from, to go from, you know, beating Poirier even like next weekend, if he wins this weekend to go from that to the welterweight title, then it might not be a big deal because Connor can call his shots. I'm sure Cameroos would be rubbing his hands together, Andrew, if, if suddenly Connor's arriving in the in the welterweight title stakes. But the, the press conference would be boring, though, PT. Connor would say something, then Usman would say the same thing directly back <laughs> yeah, to him. So we saw that video. So oh my god! Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he, Usman's an exceptional fighter. That's that's yeah. one thing, and he's very strong. Uh, he's but very he needs very to see strong. Activity. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was mad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I think this is the thing, right? Right now, I'm skeptical about what's what's you know what what Conor we're going to see on Saturday night. But if he shows up like Conor McGregor has in the past and and wins his first fight at lightweight in 2016, everything opens up for him. The whole world opens up for him. Yeah. Um, because he is he is unquestionably unrivaled in his drawing power. He can sell better than anyone in the history of the sport. And, and yeah, so I mean, as crazy like. Uh, uh, people might look at that statement from Andrew and go, that's wild to say that he hasn't done this and this and that. If he wins on Saturday, suddenly it's all just in front of him. It'll all seem like it's just one fight away. And yeah. um, I wouldn't be surprised, Andrew, if he had something like that um, in his back pocket. There's history there with Usman as well. Uh, he's obviously taken a few shots. I know he tweeted that video out you guys are talking about. So, um, yeah, but it, it's all got to happen on Saturday first. And based on what we saw in January... It's a very, very tough task. Yeah, and the way McGregor's selling pay-per-views at the moment, he's worth about three other pay-per-views to the UFC in terms of the numbers he's doing. You know what I mean? Like, he's guaranteed 1.6 million pay-per-views by the looks of things mm. uh, every time he goes. And, like, three, it takes three, if not sometimes four pay-per-views in the UFC to get that number. So but, but he, he puts up the numbers. One, one thing I will say is I really hope his next move, the next move he has on his mind is in MMA. Um. Oh, please, God! I don't. Want to I, I personally don't don't want to see him box. Like I don't. I no like I don't. There's no boxing fight in the world I want to see him in. And I think I'd speak for everyone who has enjoyed McGregor, who stays up to watch McGregor. Like that's what we want to see McGregor with a UFC belt around his waist again. That's what he does best. There is nobody in the world like him when he is in that vein of form. We just haven't seen him there in a long time. But 
I, I think Andrew was nail on the head there when he said that the Poirier fight the second time around in January, a distraction was the Manny Pacquiao fight. I just want to see Connor with, with blinkers on in terms of UFC domination again. But um, I, I don't know. Like, why is he even looking for this boxing stuff? Is it is it payday stuff? Then the UFC need to look at like what they're paying this guy. He should be getting paid. I, I'm sure he is getting paid a lot more than everyone else. But the percentages the UFC are paying their athletes isn't isn't what it should be. So like, that, why are you going to boxing when you are clearly the icon of this sport right now? That's what uh, that's what I'm often thinking ahead of these fights. Do you think they need to do maybe? Uh, I'll ask it's you, Andrew. Do you think they maybe need to do what he asked for a long time ago and ask for a piece of the pie? If they give Conor McGregor a piece of that UFC uh, WME pie, that they can actually keep him in there and keep McGregor Sports Entertainment in the octagon as opposed to seeing him go to the boxing ring because the only reason he goes to the boxing ring is for that payday. Obviously, maybe he thought he could be Floyd Mayweather and that was a once-off, but I'm sure you don't have an interest really in seeing him box again. Or I, if you could see I, do MMA, you'd rather see that. I can see myself, but can you see me and hear me? Because yeah, you're a frozen. Yeah, yeah I okay, can man. see. You look so, fabulous. Okay. So, like... <laughs> That that's a really good question, and if I can just like think of it in like nearly two spots, Connor had his whole season talk. Now, obviously, COVID that disrupted everything, but the the Connor that fought Cerrone was the mental warfare tactician, overwhelming, capitalized on Cerrone's inability to start a fight well, put him under extreme amount of pressure, and finished him ruthlessly. That that should have in theory set up Connor being able to take over the world. Dana White used it as a way to say like. This, this guy wants to fight Diego Sanchez. This guy wants to fight Diego. Like, what is he? T- and then try to turn it into like a real insulting thing, like towards Connor. Whereas Connor just wanted to fight anyone. Connor wanted to fight anyone. The UFC couldn't afford to pay Connor McGregor what even he would get for a normal fight when they couldn't get crowds in, when they couldn't get site fees from a venue for getting a Connor McGregor fight, when they couldn't get thousands of fans to break gates for a Connor McGregor fight. The UFC paddled on with what they had underpaying their fighters and putting on empty arena shows. So the UFC, he- like I, I still to this day maintain that the UFC hemorrhaged Conor, Maguer- Conor McGregor's uh, mixed martial arts career due to an inactivity and inability of booking him correctly throughout his actual career. After he won in Stockholm, he wanted to fight Diego Sanchez a month later in Mexico. He, he was trying to fight Diego Sanchez and they were like, no, whoa, 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 whoa hold the brakes, we're going to push you big in Boston in August. But he would have bet, he could have bet Diego at that time in 2013 and then fought in August anyway. He wanted to, that wanted to happen a couple of times in terms of fights that were meant to happen. So I really do think like there, he has been ready and waiting at certain times to compete and hasn't been given the opportunity to compete. That's what's had his head turned by other opportunities. Like I, 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 re, I couldn't highlight that more at the start that, having about agreements signed or having stuff in place because your management have signed Manny Pacquiao and then it's going to be an easier way to get the fight to happen afterwards. Like, I don't think that's a mistake he'd ever make again in his, in his career. Like, I don't think that's a mistake. I don't think he'll ever look past another fight in his life as long as that lives because of how much that parry loss the second time would have hurt him. So like the only time I want to see Conor McGregor in a boxing ring is when he has decided that he is entirely done with the sport of mixed martial arts and then he can fight whoever he wants to try and fight in boxing on a, however long of a run that he wants to do it. But who are we to say as fans who want to, well, I suppose, okay, fair enough, people buy pay-per-views or we give opinions on fights, but we are not the people taking the damage or doing the training or putting ourselves there for the world to tear us apart if we win or lose. So if X youtuber or any pro boxer like are going to offer or so Connor's going to generate over a hundred million boxing someone this year when the UFC haven't been able to give him fights effectively for the last year and a half bar the Parier loss since Cerrone. Why, how can you begrudge the person for going to make that money? Do you know, like there's two sides of it. I'm with, I'm with you entirely. Like I just want to see him fight mixed martial arts i want to see him go on his run i want to see him go on a season i hope that he has that in him before he retires to be able to do that again but at the same time we're not like floyd mayweather had a great thing after that thing with uh paul um 
my kids can't eat off legacy. Do you know? He's like, you can get all the legacy that you want in the world, but like at, at, at a certain point in time, like money is money. And yeah, you but they've eaten all those shrimp clubs you, you can, own as well, though. Connor, uh, the, the last thing there. Real right? collection, it's, baby. It's my favorite. It's my favorite quote. And like God, uh, this my my actual thing is that like John Cavan is a great man for uh, momentous occasions and symbolism and X, Y, and Z. He gave Connor his brown belt in September 2014 after he knocked out Dustin Parry. It's what prompted Connor to say, "I'm probably the best brown belt in the world." He, he there's a great chance he's going to be giving him his black belt this weekend if Connor beats Dustin Parry. Just for the fact that, oh, well, I give you a brown belt after Dustin Parry, so I'll give you a black belt now after Dustin Parry again. Like, that's a, in, in my mind, that's a real thing. But, like, I just, I, I don't know. I've drawn, I've drawn a blank in terms of, like, where it's going to, where it's going to lead. Do you know what I mean? I really do think that he has it in him to make another run at eliteness because I think that it doesn't leave your body. And I think at that age, it doesn't, it, it's not gone out of him. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I really don't think that it's gone out of him, but I'm sorry. I've drawn a blank there. I, no, I, I was going to say something over. about my, me being a brown belt as well, but I forget what it was like. So That's all this off. was. This yeah, was yeah, a yeah, yeah. decoration <laughs> for Andrew to highlight how good he is at jujitsu. I'm a brown belt now as well. <laughs> I was a blue belt. I was a blue belt in September, 2014. Now we're both brown belts. If Connor gets his black belt before me, I'd be delighted for him. But it's, I think he's gonna. I think he's gonna submit Dustin. That's what I'm trying to say. I think he's gonna submit Dustin. He's gonna get a well-deserved brown belt, black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and he'll be fine. You but, heard here first. Uh, d- yeah. I, I, need, I need to ask now. That's Andrew. outlandish, McGann. That is outlandish. M- McGann, I, I, I need to ask now. Who wins in 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 a no gi grappling contest? Conor McGregor versus Andrew McGann. Getting the Coca-Cola sponsorship in there. See that? <laughs> Quickly, yeah. <laughs> Where's the Heineken? Yeah, baby. Um, any drinks? Any drinks are allowed here? Actually, I'm joking. I don't know. I, I that's that's a little. If if anyone would like to pay us loads of money to find the answer to that question, then I would absolutely love to do it. But he is. Uh, I've only ever. I I've only ever trained with him once in my life, and it was very uh, like rolled with him once in my life, and it was a great role, and it's part of the reason why I wanted to walk away from covering MMA because. I felt what he, I felt like how he moved and stuff like that. And I was just kind of like, this is the person that you've been interviewing for years. And this is the person you've put up on a pedestal for years, ability wise. And he's a two eight UFC world champion, blah, blah, blah. It's like, he's just a body. He's just a person. And he's just someone who's trained like mad. So if you just train like mad, you could actually be able to be as good or if not better in pure competitive jujitsu. So it was like, that, that was like the, the one role that we've actually had is basically like life changing because I was just realizing I was like, all oh, right, he's like, despite knowing him, despite having interviewed him loads of times, never exchanged energy, never exchanged grappling energy. Like, and that's to me, like, it's not act- okay. That's so cliche. It's not actually about winning. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's about learning. If- it's, there you go, Keithy. it's about learning. Yeah, that's the clip. That's the clip. See that? That's that's the McGahan Carroll partnership there. I lob the softball up, and look, there he has it. There oh, he has it. Have Best a Keithy uh, Carroll knocks it, knocks it straight out of the park as usual. But I'll send John Cavan the check. I just, <laughs> I just think uh, in in that capability, there's two entirely different sports, like grappling. Connor is a like this is is a laugh. You shouldn't laugh. Uh-huh. Fans, fans would laugh. Connor's actually a phenomenal wrestler. Like Connor's wrestling. He's against like, Khabib through, through Sergey. Uh, don't start me on his. He was. He's the best defensive wrestler anyone's ever done against Khabib in the UFC, and had opportunities to beat him. First round, he had the opportunity to take his back and submit him. But apart from that, like Connor's, like it's ju- the whole gorilla thing that Pete was talking about earlier. He moves his body differently. He conducts himself differently. Like. The whole SBG ethos of jiu-jitsu is all based around posture and positioning and pressure. So that's why he was Gunnar Nelson straight back. That sort of, like, that's why he hit the leg drag to mount against Max Holloway in 2013. That's why he did the X-guard sweep to Nate Diaz in 2016. The man is extremely, extremely technical, a grappler. And grap, a gra- like, despite the fact he loves fighting and punching and caving people's heads in, I think he was hooked by jiu-jitsu. Like the early guys from SBG would tell you that Connor's grappling was very, very impressive from a very early stage because he completely immersed himself in it after 
the Joseph Duffy loss. And Andrew, how did that, um, what's called, role come about? Like, were you there, stand there, and one of your finest uh, check shirts, and you went, you know what, actually, McGann, I've been dying to get my hands on you for ages. Come on, we have a role. No, that um, <laughs> that role happened in uh, that role happened in New York. That's uh, at a training session in New York, and uh, post, was, post Eddie Alvarez. Uh, post Eddie Alvarez, yes, and it was it was just kind of. Uh, there was a load of people training. It was just like he wanted to do a training session and loads of people were training. And uh, I was doing rolls with, rounds with other people and he just said, do you want a round? Like, there's no, like, this is oh, the most... It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't or- orchestrated. It just happened. No, no, no. I was like, I if I was ever there, I was always there in a working capacity and I was always able to get a certain amount of rounds in at a camp if I was in Vegas for a while, whether I got to roll with someone like John or Colin Byrne or Lee Hammond. Like I was always able to get a bit of jujitsu in whenever I was there for a certain amount of time, but I was never like, I would never ask to try and impose myself to be able to train because as far as I was concerned, I was there to do a job. And if that was maybe interview someone from the camp or to like be watching the training and that building my opinion for what's going to happen from the knowledge of being able to see the sparring or stuff like that. But like, jiu-jitsu is the universal language of everyone that does jiu-jitsu do you know what i mean so it's like it really doesn't like i'd say he wrote i'd say he'd happily roll with white belts do you know what i mean i really do think that if he was in a gym in a situation and someone said here could i get a roll with you he'd have no problem with it do you know what i mean like that's there's no there's no animosity around i don't know maybe if me and pizzi rolled again there might be there's no animosity <laughs> around Brazilian jiu-jitsu do you know what i mean there really isn't it's a it's something that you have to kind of do to to get like but people can just clap hands and roll and there's no bad blood. Now, I'd never spar the man. Jesus Christ, I'd never spar the man ever in my no, life. Just I, can't hands. Can't, I couldn't couldn't do anything like that. But jiu-jitsu is like his jiu-jitsu is criminally underrated. That's as far. And and it might be a ludicrous call, Peter Carroll. But I've backed every main event in the UFC. I will continue backing Israel Adesanya to win by submission in every fight that he's had since October, November 2018 until it happens. And I will be backing Conor McGregor to win by submission this weekend as well. There, okay, there so, we so have we want to know. We want to know in the comments who who people think is going to win and how they're going to win. So, Andrew, you're going for Conor McGregor submission. What round are you going for? I, I just have to. I just have to. Oh, did you say what round? Yeah, what round? Yeah. It will be in the second or third round. I just have to do it to continue my own biases towards Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. The man, if he drops Dustin Poirier, is likely incapable of progressing to something like a whatever. But I wouldn't be surprised if off a grappling exchange from Parier, Connor's able to reverse him in either a trip or an up in his back. That's just in my head for whatever reason. I could be entirely wrong. Maybe this is going to prove why I was right to fucking stop giving an opinion on fights because I was so <laughs> off with this statement. I just, in an ideal world, that's how it happens. Kavanaugh runs in black belt above his head throws it at him and, bottom, and then everyone's the happy <laughs> P- Ross, Pete, Ross, Pete Carroll. Oh God, I was going to ask PT yeah, first but I might as well go first I don't see, we see, think we see the third belt I'm going to say it's going to end in the um, second round and I think McGregor's going to win on this occasion I think McGregor was going into the last fight and he kept on talking master class master class and I think with that master class he actually lost the smell of blood and I don't think he'll lose the smell of blood in this. I think he will throw his shots with the bad intentions we've seen before. And he's rocked Poirier before. I think he'll be able to rock him again. And when he rocks him this time, I don't think he'll let he'll uh, let him uh, survive. And I'm gonna go Conor McGregor second round TKO. PT. I'm caught between two minds. Um, I picked McGregor in January. Um, and that's based off the first fight, really. You know. Um. So I'm going to copy between two minds here. I think it's going to be McGregor in one or Poirier in three. Um, I'm going back and forth between them. I don't know, man. I just feel like I don't know. I'm really, I'm really caught between the two of them. I, I think probably more likely Poirier in three, to be honest. Um, I don't think. Tell it's me beyond... this: Are you looking to drink popper twelve at six a.m.? Are you looking to drink some hot sauce at six a.m.? <laughs> I mean, I hope I won't be drinking at all at 6 a.m. to be honest. I don't to bed. But um, I, I, like, uh, I don't know. I just think uh, being realistic about the situation, 
We haven't seen Connor win this division since 2016. It will be unbelievable if he does it. Like, it will be a, one of the biggest wins of his career if he wins this fight this Saturday. And it's not an easy fight. I do think he's capable, but based on recent history, I, I think you've got to go with Poirier. I think the clever money is in Poirier. The reason why he's favorite with all the bookmakers in the world right now is because of that win in January, and I have never met a poor bookmaker. So, uh, yeah, I think I think if you're being realistic about it, I think that's... Yeah, I think it's Poirier in three or Conor in one, but, yeah, I'm kind of siding with Poirier in three at the moment. Go on, Just one... Oh, go oh, on, sorry. Andrew. No, 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 no. I, I, I didn't know Barry was going to give a, an opinion on it as well. Sorry, Barry. Plow away. I just have a Paria <laughs> story afterwards. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go on and tell it first, yeah. Oh, all right. No, uh, it might the, change his mind. Might change his mind. <laughs> no, it, it's actually one of the interactions with fighters that has most stood out to me in my life. And PT made a joke earlier on about walking around in late nights in Vegas. I was a terrible man for not, not sleeping. Like that, it's impossible to sleep in Vegas. Dave Fogarty woke oh. up and I had a cocktail tin and a plastic bottle and I was practicing flaring in their hotel room. <laughs> I remember that. And <laughs> Sounds like my sort of roommate. He used to just, he used, I'm telling you, poor Dave, I put him through awful. He hated me when we would go away places. I'd be looking for hot spots. I'd be looking for everything. But I can remember after the first Paria fight, walking into the MGM Grand we were staying behind Hooters in the Red Rose Resort or something like that. Beautiful. It was a little hotel room. It was, yeah. It, it was nice. the art. No more ads, no more ads, it, was, it was lovely at the time. And I can remember walking over to the MGM at six in the morning and Dustin Paria was outside waiting on a taxi. And I went up and I introduced myself to him. I just said I was over here covering it as an Irish journalist. And I just wanted to say, like, I think you got a lot of unfair shit from fans and people during the week because you were the guy who had to go in and fight. And he didn't really, like, look up and he didn't really look anywhere. He just said, oh, thanks a lot, man. Just back to the gym. And I was just kind of like, that's something that is, like, literally stuck with me for so long because I was like, he did that. Like, he, he lost and he accepted it. It was a hard one to accept. He's learned from it. He's become, like one of the better fighters in the lightweight division since then like you know it's just it's something that has never left me honestly it it made me realize that they were human do you know what i mean it was probably the first humanizing thing that i'd ever been covering the sport as a younger person like i was only 21 or 22 at the time so it was like all right it's all well and good being in vegas and being like yeah mcgregor yeah mcgregor but there's always a consequence of somebody losing obviously as a credentialed member of the press i was going "Ah." (laughs) but uh (laughs) There's always, you know, there's there's always someone that has to lose in this occasion. And then there's always someone who's left feeling like their life has been torn apart. And to kind of like see that happening, like in person, like to see the reaction of it was just deeply profound. So it's like, I, I'm nearly annoyed that they're fighting because we're, we're, we are alluding to the, to the fact that like Paria is very talented. So like someone has to lose and someone has to go to bed that night a loser. I just think that's about shit to be honest I wish I everyone prefer to say learner uh, rather yeah, than learner, learner <laughs> if, if you wouldn't mind get the book again get the book again <laughs> sorry Peter <laughs> bring back the ads more ads PT more ads but, uh, not here lads like I, I agree obviously like while well, Connor was off doing his thing making the, the millions Poirier went back to the grindstone and just been grinding 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 and he's become an absolute fan's favourite I think like I think Connor could have finished it early in the last fight and then I think like he was going through his head. He wasn't he wasn't like getting enough octagon time. I think that was spoken about a lot. So I think he was trying to he almost took the foot off the gas a tiny bit, or else didn't put the foot down hard enough. And then Poirier came in with the win. So like I'm gonna go either Connor win in the second round, or else like if it goes beyond that, I think he's going into Poirier territory because like Poirier is, is a dog. But like I like I mean I'm I'm just to be honest I'm not actually really looking forward to the fight I don't really want to watch it because like, it's like it's just gonna be like I'm gonna be like is it all over is it all over you know, I mean, you know he's he's the only man who steps in that octagon and I actually get nervous for him. he really yeah. is like I'm like oh the whole Irish MMA scene's riding on this yeah. you better fucking deal for us yeah this is our, this is Ireland's like Euros as well I know we had Craig Coakley on and said it was that as well but like this is actually our Euros because the next day is the Euro final. So, I mean, we're all being... So, who would have guessed? Four Irish lads picking Conor McGregor to win. Who would have guessed? Except for I didn't pick him to win. Oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, sorry, three Irish lads and then uh, an, an import from... I don't know where we're importing them from. The only time... The only other time I haven't picked Conor to win was the Habib fight. Yeah. PT was the only one. I was I was unfollowed and blocked by many a, by many a McGregor team member. <laughs> and Ariel Hawani as well. That fella. 
Nah, Love he's the best mate. What are you talking about? He nah, loved nah, me. Nah, followed nah. me that day. Not a joke. <laughs> Not a joke. Yeah, so let us know in the comments who you think is going to win because, like, I mean, either way, this is going to be crazy. Uh, lads, in the comment of it, uh, do, do we have anything else to say on that before we move on to some of the other fights? No, let's look at the rest of the car, Bosmo. Yeah. Uh, obviously, in the common event of the welterweight division, Gilbert Burns is taking on Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Uh, PT, this is obviously going to, it's like a classic, uh, uh, like, uh, sorry, grappler versus striker. Um, what way are you seeing this fight going into? I think, I, I fancy Wonderboy, man. I think he's one of the hardest fights in the division. I think Gilbert Burns is great on the ground, but I don't, I don't think he's shown um, a great intensity to get the fight to the ground since he's gone to welterweight. I think Wonderboy is going to force that awkward situation. He's been talking about it for years now. Boy, is he, he's the only one who hasn't fought Usman, and he's beaten all these top contenders. And, and to be honest, I think it would be a great fight, him and Usman. So I'd love him to force the UFC's hand a bit. Obviously, we want Leon in there before it, but if he beats Burns, a guy who was in that title mix after a very quick ascent at welterweight, I think he is asking big questions of the UFC, and I think he'd ask big questions of Usman as well. So he's one of the nicest guys in the sport. I'm sure he's talked to him before. Um, so I'm going. I'm going Thompson. Andrew, what do you think of this? And also, do you think the, the winner will deserve the title shot after? Andrew's definitely what's called thinking uh, for Burns. He, that that jujitsu uh, yeah. game is too strong. <laughs> no, he definitely. Well, like that. I I've started to come around to the prospect that like jujitsu doesn't start start stops working once the person's able to like actually punch you and stop you from taking you down. Like jujitsu <laughs> is only as effective as it should be when the person is able to to utilize it. I don't think he's going to be able to utilize it in the way that he would like to be able to utilize it against Wonderboy, despite the fact he's bet like top like top tier grapplers like back to back in terms of Gunner and then Damian Maya. He's just like what PT said about him kind of saying like I'm the guy who should be fighting for the title. I know that he's been like the he's been like the the biggest like not necessarily underdog but like on the cusp guy in the UFC for like so long do you know what i mean in terms of like did he beat woodley that night in um new york, in new york. Right, right it was a draw was it the first yeah. one yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and then the so new york it's like it was next yeah oh sorry so and then he then he fought him again and then he lost so it's like he's always been capable but like he should have never lost to anthony Battis. do you know what i mean not to be bad about it but it's just like wonder by thompson has both of these lads have one last shot in my opinion, one last shot and one last run. But I would say that Gilbert Burns has more damage on his clock despite not having lost. And my only theory for that is, is that when you, like, okay, physical physical is a thing in terms of what you can take in MMA, but, like, mental and emotional is definitely next to it in terms of how it can derail your career. The fact that he went on a great run and then there was the big story about fighting a former teammate in the main event, he's finally getting his opportunity. He's fighting Usman, and then he comes up short. That's that's a hard thing to come back from. That's a like I'm convinced now that that is a hard that is going to be a hard thing to come back from for him. And he might be past his actual opportunity of beating top contenders. And it's just a theory. It's he could he could still well beat the majority of people at the top of that division. But I really do think that sometimes fighters think that they'll only get one shot at something and when you have to like kill yourself so much and hurt yourself so much to get to that opportunity when you come up short in such devastating fashion because Usman handled him like properly handled him like I think you lose a bit of yourself and I think that Wonderboy will be able to keep him out of range and actually just ping him about the place Ross what about yourself obviously Wonderboy did like Wonderboy is turning into Wonder Man at this stage do you think like who do you think is going to win this uh, no, I have a wonder boy in this one. Uh, obviously, he's coming off two really good decision wins against Jeff Neal and Vincente Luque. You sort of almost have to feel that the UFC were putting those guys in there to beat Wonder Boy. They were looking for them to come up on, on the rise and make a name off him. Uh, I think Wonder Boy is alluded to it. His uh, level of striking is a different caliber, and I think he's going to be able to keep Gilbert Burns at bay on the feet and pick him apart from the outside. I even think maybe even uh, a second round head kick knockout as well. Now, I know Dan Hooker put Gilbert Burns away before, so why can't Stephen Wonderboy Thompson? I, I'm just going to be biased towards Wonderboy Thompson because when we met him, he was just so nice. I couldn't pick against him. And everything he does, the way he like picks up the kids and brings them to karate school and all, like, I mean, that chap is just an inspiration for most people. Yeah, but that doesn't help you win fights, but yeah. That's, doesn't help you win fights, but like, that's just what I believe. <laughs> 
I saw him in, in Abu Dhabi for the Habib and Poirier fight. I don't I think he was a guest fighter. And the guy was just standing in the airport and there was like 200 people around him. And he got off the same plane as me. And he stayed there and he signed every autograph, did everything. Now imagine after a 16-hour flight or something to Abu Dhabi from the US and arrived at the hotel like four hours after me, smiling ear to ear. Yeah. And I was like... Mate, when do you freak out? You just must go back to your room and beat the shit out of the pillows, <laughs> scream in the shower when no one's around you. I mean, I don't know, man. I think he's subhuman how nice he is. So, yeah, 100% agree with his lads. He is a, he's an absolute angel of a man. My yeah. mate's been DMing him since 2016. I was asking him to go for a pint in New York. And he's like, man, buddy, sorry, I'm only here for this. I'm in and out, but we'll definitely do it next time. P.S. I know Andrew McGann. <laughs> no, he, he, not, he that wouldn't get that. He'd probably that'd get him blocked. He just turned around and he was like, "Here, uh, he's like, he's just a huge fan of Wonder Boy." Like he, there was an interview I did years ago with Cerrone where he asked me to ask him. My friend Caron said, "Ask him how many hands his horses is before you start the interview," and I was just like, "What?" <laughs> and it was just like, apparently you measure horses by hands. Yeah, like yeah, I didn't know that. Ask Cerrone that. It was probably the most engaging answer I got off Donald Cerrone. Because I asked him something about his horses, but uh, that was just Karen and Wonderboy, good friends. Sorry, no, that's right. <laughs> shout out, shout out to Kieran. Yeah, lad, right, lads. This one here, if you've all have the card up in there, I want I want you to tell the people at home like what other fight you're looking for, looking forward to, or what other fighter they have to make sure. Yeah, that we'll, you... we'll pick one each. One, yeah, Ryan. Who wants to go first? I'll well, go. We all know who Andrew wants. Go on then, Andrew. No, no. Pete, Peter, you go. I've I've two choices, so if it's left, I'll I'll talk about it. I I think Ryan Hall, Ilya Tapuria <laughs> is the best fight. I think he's one of the best fights on the card. Tapuria's looked unreal. We saw him in Cage Warriors before he went to the UFC. He's an unbelievable grappler, but Ryan Hall is the shit, and he looks unbelievable striking these days. He's so confident in striking because he knows if anyone tries to take him down, they're in hell. And I think he's just one of the most interesting personas in the UFC today. So um, I, I am all aboard the Ryan Hall Hope train. I know and Andrew has been there since his purple belt 50-50 days, but uh, I think Ilya Tapuri is top class, so I think that's really, really one of the best matchups on the whole card. That's yeah, gonna, That's on lie. the prelims. That's on the prelims for the people listening at home. Yeah, not going to lie, PT. I, I just love the fact that, you know, there's a chance there's going to be a 50-50 uh, card opportunity in the UFC because it's such a rare feat that I'm like, Ryan Hall is more CTV. Andrew McGann, I know that was your pick because you know, the jiu-jitsu <laughs> wizard that you are. But go on, tell us, tell us your other one. Uh, I just think that no other person has ever had the same potential of superstardom or fan attention as someone like O'Malley. So despite the fact that he's fighting like a, a newcomer who's coming into the promotion, it's the just... The wish version like, of himself, as some people are calling it. Yeah, just any sort of opportunity that he has to showcase his ability, like his... Young, young fighters around the world are studying Sean O'Malley in the way that fighters who are at the top of their games now were studying Conor McGregor a couple of years ago. Like, Sean O'Malley is on a, on a different planet in many, many ways, just in how he links his grappling and his striking and his footworks and his feints in everything about him. He just carries himself in an entirely different manner of any fighter that I've seen since Conor. So that's the... That's just any time I get to watch a Sean O'Malley fight is considered a, a bonus for me. But on the Pete, he said about his about Ryan Hall striking, just to give one thing about that. I think he's, I think, thanks to Faras, I think Faras is about to be re heralded as one of the best MMA coaches in the world because I think, uh, he, he obviously he wouldn't have lost that because of St. Pierre, but it's, it's gonna like Hall has talked in interviews about how they've basically like refined his striking to this stage that like. He, he throws them mad spinning wheel kicks because he knows that if he misses and they take him down, the momentum of his body as the wheel kick goes past the head basically leads him perfectly into an invert onto the ground so that he can actually then just invert straight in on their legs where he's already multiple steps ahead of the people. His striking is designed to now complement the possibility of them taking him down. And if they're not re prepared for it, it's just funny striking that's pinging the head off boys who shouldn't be getting the head pinged off them by a grappler. So it's like I think I think Ryan Hall is the UFC champion in waiting. To be honest, it's gonna like without a doubt. I don't know. It, it, it depends on whether he'd be able to outbox Max Holloway. Uh, for me, Big long legs. That that is true. That is true. For me, like 
I know ever since I laid eyes on Nico Price, I- I've always just thought, what a fucking fighter. You know what I mean? Like hammer fist <laughs> from his back knockout. You know what I mean? <laughs> Up kick knockouts. He's an absolute animal. And then when you think you couldn't fall in love with Nico Price, you see Michel Pereira, the Capoeira King. Um, UFC, uh, Sean Shelby, he can retire after making this match. This is a, <laughs> this is a match of made in heaven for MMA fans. Two of the most entertaining welterweights on the planet. Throw them in there. It's probably going to be a boring fight now after me saying all that. Yeah. But like, like these guys are absolutely brilliant to watch. So I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, uh, yeah. We were talking about this off air, but like, I, I'm not too sure if this fight's still on. But Taito Vasa versus Greg Hardy. Uh, I'd love to just see Taito Vasa win with a knockout and then do a shoey with with uh, with the lads in the front row. row you know. Yeah, but I would Guinness. absolutely love to see that too. Please knock out Greg Hardy. Thank you. <clears throat> I think everyone wants to see Greg Hardy get knocked out. In fairness, it, Bam Bam Two Vasa might be you know, the most fan favorite heavyweight, maybe bar Derek Lewis in the UFC. And then Greg Hardy is obviously the most hated heavyweight in the UFC. So yeah, I think we'd all, we'll all be rooting for Bam Bam. Yeah. Uh, for people that aren't aware, the UFC press conference is on Thursday. The weigh-ins are obviously on Friday and then the big show is on Saturday. Lads, like uh, th- this was absolutely brilliant. I, f- I feel like it's very nostalgic for a lot of people. And it was like, th- I just thought it was a fantastic idea to get the two years on, especially you, Ross, sorry, uh, you included. But like before we wrap things up, is there anything else you want to say about th- about um, this weekend's event and or anything else? And uh, no, just shout out to the natural born killer as well, Carlos Conda. He is on the card. He, he can't not pay that man some respect. But uh, Andrew, PD, do you, uh, PT, do you have anything you want to uh, plug or anything? Just check out my new show with Ariel Hawani and Chuck Mendenhall, which will be starting very soon on a date that I can't say out loud. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll make sure oh, the man with the you. hats there as well. What a man. Yeah, man. What a legend, man. Chuck's the greatest writer in the history of the sport. Both of them are my heroes, you know? So it's it's unbelievable that you end up doing a podcast with them um, for like a, a huge publication like The Ringer. So um, I'm delighted. I can't wait to do it. I'm very excited. And it will be happening very soon. But a day I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what have you got to plug there? Uh, I just want to give a shout out to Damien Rooney, um, who his Instagram handle is at Right Fitness. Damien is a former professional MMA fighter from Ireland who retired a couple of years ago, but he attempted to break the world record for the most amount of chin ups in 24 hours and he tore his shoulder Jesus. 16 hours into the last one and he was on course to he was on course to break it. So he's going to be attempting it again this Saturday. And uh, he's now like six kilos. Yeah, it's like, it's not a Goggins world record. Goggin has pull-ups, I think it is. But Dan was doing chin-ups. And uh, I'm I'm there helping him in terms of broad, like live streaming it and documenting it for the Guinness Book of World Records. So he's like six or seven or eight kilos lighter than he was the last time. He can do like 3,000 chin-ups or he can do like a thousand chin ups in a three hour setting without even like breaking a sweat and pushing the pace at the minute. So I've never met anyone who's as committed and as focused as Damian Rooney. And I just want to wish him all the best ahead of him breaking a world record. This we're going to be watching the McGregor fight in his garage, like as he's coming towards the end. So it'll be six o'clock on Saturday, Sunday morning. Damo starting at eight o'clock on Saturday morning. So I'm going to be there for like the day and then I go to sleep for a couple of hours and someone else takes over and then I come in for the night shift. But we're going to be watching McGregor Parry in his garage as he's already like broken a world record or like steaming past the world record, just fucking doing chin-ups. So Perfect. yes, Damien, we can't wait for you to break a world record on Saturday. Come on, well, let, on us know if you need to plug, let us know if you need to plug that, uh, Andrew, or uh, if you're... At uh, Right Fitness on Instagram. At Right Fitness, right. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely plug that at some stage because that's absolutely incredible. I wasn't expecting you to come out with that, but uh, I'm very go. impressed yeah. nonetheless. Ross, you'll try to break it out for next week, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for uh, most, shout out for to most fall Sheridan, down. Uh, Sheridan as well, fighting this week and making her pro debut as well. And uh, that's another, another Irish uh, representative fighting this weekend as well. Uh, Ross, anything else to say before we wrap things up? Uh, no, guys. Um, thanks a million for joining us today. Two legends of the Irish media and May game. And if you haven't watched this video, make sure to like it. Make sure to share it. Make sure to subscribe. And as always, stay, stay energized. Energized show. Up the Irish. It's and sussing you guys a couple of times. I've seen a couple of clips. I think you're doing... Some interviews with Dylan Moran and that, but I, I, I saw. So keep going. Keep up the good work, guys.